Hi, I'm Ernie Conover. In this little online course in building a shaker candle box, I hope to share with you some of my love of hand tools. I think hand tools make a great option and you can actually get better work out of hand tools in some cases than you can out of machine tools. And they are often faster for one or two pieces. I'll talk about that as we go along. This box uh, is a reproduction of a box that would have been used in the first half of the 19th century at the Shaker settlement at Canterbury. And it was made just to put loose candles in and keep track of them because that's the only lighting they had uh, at night was candlelight. It's a nice exercise in this. We will learn to cut through dovetails, which is the simplest type of dovetails. And we'll also learn how to smooth wood with hand planes and how to clean up the carcass with, clamp with hand planes once we've glued everything together and how to deal with wood movement. Uh, on the online tab under the woodworking section of our website, you will find a short video by one of my past apprentices, Scott Butler, on the Carpenter's Triangle. I won't elaborate on the triangle during this video uh, because it is completely in that very short video. And you need to watch that before you start work with this video as the guidance. All right, I have the parts for the first candle box laid out. I have carpenter's triangles here and here, which are telling me all the orientation of these pieces throughout this process. Now, an important tr trick with any joinery machine or hand tool is don't ever do anything twice. And don't do it before you have to. So the first order of business really would be to smooth all the inside surfaces of this box. Because once it's together, we can't get in there with hand planes. And even sanding with my hand would be very difficult inside. So it's easier to do this now. We'll do it with planes. And the best uh, plane for this is what's called a smoothing plane. This is the shortest of all planes. There are numbers one through five. This is actually a five and a half. It's a Veritas custom plane, which I consider to be about the best plane in the world these days. You always read the grain. My grain is rising this way in this board, so I want a plane in this direction. And I'll just raise my bench dogs very slightly. Pinch that down on the bench. A little bit too much. I'm going to pick that cutter up just a little bit. And that's all there is to it. ready to start laying out our dovetails. Now, dovetails have traditionally been laid out on a ratio. While we buy dovetail cutters for routers today at certain angles, in history they were always spoken of as a ratio, and they range from one to five, one to five, one to six, and all the way up to one to eight. And this would be a base of one, a height of five. The hypotenuse of that triangle is the angle of our dovetail. This would be a one to six, which, which is probably the strongest of all dovetails. And this would be a one to eight, which is a more stylized dovetail and became popular towards the end of the eight, uh, 18th century 
and was very popular throughout all of the 19th century and is common to what's called empire furniture. And that's why it's often called an empire dovetail. We will cut ours at one to six. Many of the shakers made their candle boxes out of pine and they would use one to fives. We would take a device called a bevel And we will just put this down on our bench hook. And you, th this is called a bench hook. I also have put plans in the online instruction tab of our website for you to make one of these. But these are excellent to keep from sawing your bench. If you want to saw a piece with a back saw, you can simply saw it right here. And you saw the bench hook and not your bench. Very easy to make, make it in a few minutes. But at any rate, uh, dovetail angles were commonly scribed into the top of the bench or more commonly the bench hook because they needed to go to that angle so much. There were also all kinds of gizmos to help you lay that out. This is the one to six dovetail jig that I've had for years and uh, it does a fine job. Okay, after planing these all up, we will take what's called a marking gauge and we'll set it to just a little thicker than the thickness of our material here. And this is the pin board, the front and the back. And so we'll make a little scratch line that's just beyond the thickness of the material, like that. And we'll do that to the faces of the pin boards. I actually do it against my chest, like this, for small pieces like this. And you can see we have a very distinct line there. And I've already done it to the tail boards right here. We can set those aside and we'll now lay out the pins by lining up our carpenter's triangles, pinching these together so they're in good alignment with each other. We'll put this in our bench vise right here, what's called the tail vise in a woodworking bench. And I actually cheated a little bit. I've laid out where the center of each of our pins is. And I've also put in that online tab a copy of this flow ch chart, which I made for a book I wrote in 2009 called A Woodworker's Guide to Dovetails. It covers both hand dovetailing and machine dovetailing. And it gives you the step-by-step -step instructions I'm going through in this video. And so we're cutting this part here, right here first, which are the pins which will go through the tails. And again, they used rulers in former times, but they used what are called dividers a lot. And so by taking the spaces between the dovetails, there's four of those, so we divide the width of this by four, we come with 1.09 would be the answer, and so I just set a set of dividers to approximately that, and then I played around to them to where I could lightly step them off four times, and then I marked that with a pencil. I now uh, have a little set of dividers, a very small pair that they don't even make them this small anymore, but they did once upon a time. And this will be the half pin dimension. This is set to 5 30 seconds, and the full pin will be a strike, a double strike of that, which will be 5 16 So I will just make the half pins at each edge. You always make a half pin at each edge. As you lay these out, it's useful to take a piece of blackboard chalk and rub it on the wood 
and then rub that in with your fingers and it allows you to see these strike marks a lot better. And now I come to these center ones and I will swing that around and strike both sides of that. And now I will get out an awl, what I call a scribe, and I take a standard awl and grind it to four flats at the tip. Both of these came that way. This is a Three Cherries brand German scriber, and this is a Japanese one. And I can now take my little layout tool here, and if you remember that the pin is always going to be bigger on the inside of the carcass, you'll never go wrong. So I line up with that gauge line and I would come to each side. And by laying these two parts out together like this as a Siamese pair, I save a lot of time and I also get a perfect match between the two halves of my candle box here. So there is our finished layout. It's a good idea to take a pencil for beginners here and scribble this waste so that you know where to cut. I also encourage beginners to put a little X on what you're keeping. The whole secret of life is what you keep and what you throw away. There. Now, while we have these tools in our hands, we'll just turn this right around like this. Put it back in the vise and do the other side. All right, now that we have both ends marked, we're ready to start sawing. And for that, we use a back saw. I have a gaggle of back saws here that I use for all different size works and types of work. For this one, I'm going to use this little tiny Veritas, which is a modern back saw, reasonably priced, uses plastic, but it actually works very well. Now, I've followed all the directions on this cheat sheet that you can follow along and when you do this on your own you can use that to good avail. But I always cut from the inside of the carcass so I turn this around. Pins are wider on the inside of the carcass so I'm going to cut from this side and I always cut that way and it sort of builds in that I'm doing the right thing at the right time into my head. I've also taken some pains to make sure that's vertical in the vise. And I also now come in with a small square and my scribe and I make a little vertical line from our gauge line up to my layout line so that it helped me guide that saw straight down. Now the back saw, the trick of using this is to grab it like you would a pistol. It's got a pistol grip. I find that pointing my finger makes it go straighter too. I don't know why, but I've had a lot of apprentices and students that agree with me. But at any rate, we're just going to come in here and lightly start that. Saw it down and just touch that gauge line. And now that was one to six to the right, if you will, and I cut the far side of each one, and now I'll come back going one to six to the left, 
and cut these. Just touch the gauge line. Now, an important concept here is I'm cutting in the waist. The left-hand side of my saw is splitting that layout line, and I'm cutting right down to the other line. And why a, a, a marking gauge line or a scriber line is, is better than a pencil here is because it's a line of zero dimension where a pencil line actually has width, and it gets hard to know that you're on the center. I have a very good friend, John Dodd, in Canandaigua, New York, that cuts him with a pencil and he does unbelievable work. So if a pencil makes you happy, use it, but be consistent. It takes some practice to get to where you work on your layout lines. That's it. Now, I would actually saw all four sides of this before I went on, but in the interest of time here, I'm gonna saw the other half of the joint to show you how it works. All right, we have all our pins sawn. And now I like to put a bench hook down, or even sometimes two bench hooks. I also have a scrap piece of heavy leather here called bullhide that I like to put under my pieces. It makes them slide around less and it also quiets the blows of the hammer on the chisel quite a bit. Secure this down on the bench with what's called a screw clamp and you open and close these by grabbing the spindle nearest the back of the clamp and your right hand and if you turn them like this, they'll open. And the idea here is to put them down and then only turn the back screw here, which this acts as a fulcrum. This touches just the tip of the jaw under the bench and that locks that right down. I'm now going to get out some chisels and I'm gonna find a chisel that's a good fit here. I might be able to go one size bigger, but a little too big. This is the one we want. Now, traditionally, workers have driven chisels in the West with wooden hammers, either a hammer type hammer like this, or a round Carver's mallet, which I think is better for the beginner. They'll do much better with that because with this type of mallet, you have to line the head up to get a square blow. The other one doesn't require nearly as much precise alignment. We're going to drag down here and actually feel the chisel go into the scribe line that we left by the marking gauge, and we're going to just Tap that lightly with a hammer like that and we're going to go right behind that and break out a little piece. And We're going to go back and now we're going to lean this chisel about five degrees in that direction because we want to undercut this joint to the middle. The idea here is to go about halfway. I just did. Now my chisels are very sharp. Now I'm leaning at five degrees. Now, when I come down for this second cut, I never go more than half the distance of the length of the pin. And I drive fairly straight down, rocking it a little, and then flicking it like that. 
And the idea is to drive down and like plate tectonics, you're making that whole piece split along the grain to the bottom of your cut. Do not turn this over, it's a waste of time, and try to chisel to the other cut, for you'll end up splitting the piece and you take a lot more time doing it. Now you notice I stair stacked this. If I was making four or five boxes, I'd do all the work, I'd cut all these, I'd stack them all up on the bench like that, like a big stack of stairs and just work up and down because I save a lot of time clamping one unit than I do each of these individually. It's another little time saver. So I can go right down here and do this one. And because I'm on the inside of the pit, which is narrower, a real friend you want at your bench is a bench brush because if you have a wood chip down here and you clamp this down and pound on it, you will really put a heck of a dent in those two pieces of wood. So we're locked down. We'll go back to our chisel. And now we'll cut this side. Leaning at five degrees. Start listening now, you'll hear it. Hear the tone change? Here we are. There, I have half my pins cut at this point, and you can see that they look pretty good. Generally, you will want to go in with a bench knife and just clean up these corners a little bit. A jack knife will do this just fine if it's sharp. This is actually a Japanese bench knife. I actually bought in Kyoto. Now we're ready to transfer these marks to the other piece. There, that's the way they go together. And it's important to notice that by angling the cut five degrees, we have a low spot in the middle right here right where those two cuts come together. And that means when the other half mates with this, we'll get a nice light tight fit at each of these edges and not create a hump, which, which would be the worst of all possible worlds, that would push them up and you'd have a big gap here. So that's the reason for the undercut. So this is one of the few times I sit down to do this. My father wouldn't allow a stool in the workshop. He said, just make you lazy. Some truth to that, maybe not. So what we're gonna do here is take these two pieces like this with our carpenter's triangle like that, open them like a book, and if we now take these two halves, they would go like this, and these two halves would go down on that half like this. So, doing this half, you can see our triangles line up. I'm going to put the base right on the gauge line that I scribed. 
and I'll reach in with our scriber and reach back in there and just follow where that meets with the wood, make a little scratch mark down in there. Always do it from the inside like this, never do it from out there because the curved or slanted slope of that pushes that across the grain of the wood and gives you a clear mark. If you do it the other way, it's liable to follow the grain of the wood and you won't have a true transfer of the pattern. There we go. Chalk even after the fact will help you to see those marks a little better. We go back to our back saw and many may find that it's useful to scribe a line across the work like this where those meet the end. And while we were sawing at a one to six angle across and straight down, we're now cutting straight across and at a one to six angle downward. And again, we're cutting in the waist side. The body of the saw should be out here in the waist. And you may want to scribble that waist right here. So cutting on the waist side, the saw's out here in what we're throwing away. One to six downward. thing we'll do here is turn this right on edge. Remember I said to mark all the way around the tailboard so we can go right on that marking gauge going to the waist side and just cut that little half where the half pin comes through and I usually go in with a chisel and just clean right up to my gauge line and I'll turn this over and do it again. If you do much hand tool joinery, it's nice to have some pegs. I've turned shaker pegs that I can hang all my saws right here because I use them all the time. Now we'll put this down on a piece of bull hide. Too big. This is where having a pretty good range of chisels is awfully useful. As I mentioned before, the mallets, but Japanese drive their chisels with steel. They always have. So this is what's called a Japanese barrel hammer. It weighs 570 grams, which makes it about 22 or 23 ounce hammer. It's going from the other side now. you just hang these over the edge, you can usually kind of just work these out. Again, a bench knife to clean any fuzziness out of there is always a good move. Now, it's a bad idea to dry fit a dovetail. 
So at this point, we're going to check the fit, but we're not going to actually put them together or we will destroy what is really an interference. We're cutting a line on line fit here. And so we're going to put this down. Now, I purposely cut this one a little bit the wrong side of the gauge line right here just to show you how this works. But if I put this down here, it's not wanting to go. And if I take a hammer and just tap it like that, it put a pretty good dent right there where it's supposed to be a little wider. You can see that one is narrower. So to fix that, I'm just going to come in on this piece, putting it down on my bench hook, and putting it right on the real gauge line. And now, lining up my triangles, it wants to go together. And I will not assemble this actually together until I put glue on it because, because the glue is a lubricant, which will actually make it slide together nicely. And we'll get a good assembly that's square, everything else. So you need to now repeat what I did with all of your pieces. And next week we'll cover gluing this up, which takes a little bit more work. And we'll work on fitting the other parts of our box. And we'll get through this in style. So have fun in the fortnight till the next video presentation and uh, stay safe. This is Ernie Conover saying goodbye.